Never forget the moment we kissed the night of the hayride. The way that we hugged to try to keep warm while taking the sleigh ride. Magic moments, memories we've been sharing. Magic moments when two hearts are caring. Time can't erase. Grandparents. I'll start with my grandfather Morris. I can't go back. Grandparents, as far back as I can go. Grandfather Morris was an engineer. He held two engineering degrees, matter of fact, electrical and mining, and he married uh, an English lady. And my mother and her sister were the only two of that family. I never knew him. I only met her briefly. They were very English in that children should be seen and not heard. And when she came to visit one time in the States, as she called it, um, I don't remember her ever talking to us, so I never knew her. But mother was naturally very happy in her childhood. In fact, when we went back to England on a business trip, uh, five, six, seven years ago, we visited my mother's home where she grew up and uh, in Bolton, England, and it's been turned into a nursing home right now. Mother um, went away to boarding school at the age of 10. Can you imagine doing that? But all of her friends were there, had gone, because they were in school. So she went to Wales, which is the boarding school she went to. Her sister had gone to and uh, she stayed there, except for small vacations until she was 17. Then she came back to Bolton. She was, became a debutante, had all the balls and all the hoopla that goes with it in those days. And she was all set for uh, finishing school in Switzerland. They, my grandfather had paid and so forth, and World War I broke out. So naturally, Mother didn't go, and she joined the uh, British Air F Red Cross. And I still have her pins. And she was did things that she had never done before because she was brought up in a very um, comfortable home, shall I say. No money, no other servants and stuff. So uh, she was at a tennis court one time. They joined, they had belonged to a tennis club, which were all over England then, and I think still today. And this man came on the courts and happened to be this tall, dark mother said, handsome man, and it was my father. They met, played tennis, and mother said, that was it. She had dated all kinds of men and so forth and so on, but she said, that was the man I am going to marry. So she, after they dated and so forth, she went back to her folks and said, I met the man I'm going to marry. And my grandparents said, oh, because she had a lot of wealthy suitors and they assumed it would be one of those. It's Joseph Sherry. Well, who's that? Then mother began to explain. And of course, I'm sure she, he, she introduced them. And they said, three things wrong with him. With him. One, he has no means of support at this time. Um, he comes from the States. And the third thing is, he's a Catholic. None of those were pluses. My mother said, I don't care. 
I will marry Joe Sherry. And she did. So they um, did get married. I have the picture over there. And um, one of her the maids said to Mother, you know, Miss Hilda, she said, I predict something, and I'm usually right. She said, I predict when you go to the States with this Joseph Sherry, you will be very happy. <laughs> You'll have a lot of children, and you won't be rich. So Mother said to me many years later, you know, it all came true. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Grandfather Sherry had come over from Ireland, or his, rather, his grandfather, I believe, came over from Ireland, and he was born in Sturbridge, the old, old Sturbridge, Massachusetts. He was a Massachusetts Yankee, as my mother used to tell my father when she was angry at him, and uh, he married a lady from Massachusetts, and they had four boys, and... Um, my dad was the second oldest. So when my grandfather's brother lived in England and owned a food distribution center, that's all I know, and he called my grandfather to come over and help him, which he did, and took all the boys and, of course, his mother with them, with him. And um, he was killed, I guess he was there a couple of years, and he was killed in the business. He fell. So my father stayed, as several of the others did. Dad went to a private school, Catholic school. He would not leave home. And uh, he was very, very shy at that time, so I was told. And he, uh, he stayed there, and then Dad went to the University of Manchester as a medical student, went through all of it except one year, and then he joined the British Army. Now I said to him one day, Dad, how can you join the British Army? You're, you're an American. He said, in those days, I really didn't care. I lied, he said, and said I was British. He had picked up enough accent to get by. World War I broke out. So he had joined, unbeknownst to his mother, the Air Force, or Air Corps, whatever they called it in Britain at the time. He came home and told my, mother, my grandmother, and my grandmother raised such a fit because the flyboys in those years lasted about an hour a day a week. So he was so, she was so upset, he went back and he changed his MO, I guess you'd call it, to infantry. So being college, he became a major, captain rather, captain. And he was in the trenches for two years in France. We are on uh, a camera, and I want to introduce you to uh, the Brewer side of the family. And originally, they were um, uh, came from Alsace near Belgium, and they settled settled in Holland. And uh, in the early uh, 1890s. Uh, they came over to uh, the U.S. as whalers, and they settled on uh, in Long Island on the tip of Greenport. Um, my great grandfather settled in uh, uh, West Sable, and he decided that he would like to fish rather than whale. Uh, there. They uh, lived in West Sable and started a family, uh, which my dad was uh, um, born there, and he uh, followed uh, the tradition of uh, his parents and grandparents as fishermen. From there, he um, decided he, got, he had gotten married and. Uh, he became uh, a chauffeur for the Kennedy, the Bouvier family, which was uh, out in Southampton, 
and Bouvier, of course, was the uh, father, the uh, mother uh, of Jacqueline Kennedy. So, on my mother's side, uh, I could go back only to my grandfather, who came from Czechoslovakia with his wife of, uh, uh, she was, I think, was about 18 years old. They settled in Great River, Long Island, and he became a master uh, gardener and also a saddle maker for the Cutting Estate, which is now a huge arboretum uh, on Long Island. Uh, they had a family of uh, four girls and, and I think five sons. And my mom was the oldest, and uh, mom uh, met my dad uh, one day when his uh, sh his boat came in up to the uh, Great River, and it was uh, iced in. And uh, for what the story goes, uh, he uh, walked about two miles up to the Great River uh, home of my mom. And there, that's where they met, and uh, uh, they pursued a courtship, and they were married. They got married, and they moved to West Sable, and that was considered the, the probably the biggest fishing and oyster business in, in on Long Island. And uh, my grandfather my, uh, bought out the. Uh, Blue Point Oyster uh, Company, and my dad worked there for a number of years. And uh, according to the, the story, that his father lost the entire corporation, the company, in a poker game. Um, my wife and I visited the Blue Point Oyster Company about five years ago, and there was a guard there. And he wanted to know who we were, who we were, and what are we doing here? And there were very limited uh, areas, uh, very few oysters uh, which were coming in because of the uh, uh, problem of, of putrefaction in the, in the water. And when I told him who we were, he wouldn't believe it, and he showed us all around. And of course, it brought back memories of my childhood. And I mentioned that story to him, and he was—he uh, wrote it all down, and he couldn't believe it. I am the oldest, as my brother Bill. Whenever we go to a reunion or a party, he's got a fantastic sense of humor. He and I haven't met this person. He'll say, "Betty, I want you to come and meet Joe Blow over here." Oh, fine. He'll say, "Now, Joe, this is my oldest sister, Betty." So <laughs> they all know that. But uh, I'm the oldest, Aunt Peg's next, Aunt Joan, now, Uncle Bill and Aunt Joan, and Uncle Joe, they're the five of us. So my mother had her big family. She wasn't used to big families. They, she had came from two, and her friends all had two. But uh, mother had five. Very happy. Mother and dad were very, very happy all through their life, really. Never with my mother, somewhere when she came to the States, um, she converted. I don't really know at what time, at what point. She converted to Catholicism only for Dad, only for the children. My dad had probably insisted in those days uh, that we all be brought up Catholic. Um, Mother said, fine. She had no problem. So she converted. But half her mind, <laughs> all through her life, was half Episcopalian and half Catholic. And she used to tell the priest that all through her life, too. And uh, so as far as there was no problem, of course, with us, except Mother once in a while would voice her opinion that the Pope is wrong on certain things. But Dad just smiled and never said anything. You remember Nanny. <clears throat> so uh, she would go to the priest after Mass in this Washington, Father Hennessy. Uh, he was a little cranky old man. So after Mass, Mother waited for him, and he always waited for her. 
okay, Mrs. Sherry, what did I do wrong today? So off they go to his little cubicle. Mother would tell him if she thought he did something wrong or disagreed. So when we finally left Washington, he came over to Mother. He said, you know, I'm going to miss our wonderful little talks. <laughs> Dad would just stand by and let it go. But we never discussed religion, ever, ever, in our house. Um, <laughs> as we grew up in this one house, Dad would stand on the porch when we would all go outside after dinner, and you could play in the streets in those days, and he would go <coughs> clap, clap, clap real hard, and we would all go. I mean, there was no question of not obeying my father. He wasn't stern or strict or rough. He was the kindest man. He just had to look at you. Yes, Dad. Okay, Dad. But I was the oldest, and I thought I got the most discipline because <laughs> when I was um, 12, 13, 14, I was allowed to go to the movies with a fellow. And I remember every time I came home, I was given a time to come home, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, whatever. If I was 5 or 10 minutes late, and let's say it was later, everyone's in bed. I would open the door, and I'd look up those stairs, and there sat my father, in his night clothes, waiting for me, like this. Big smile on his face, and I thought, oh, that was worse than a beating. And he'd say, Betty, you are 10 minutes late. I said, well, of course, I started the excuses. <clears throat> I'd say, well, Dad, whatever the excuse was, 10 minutes late. And with that, he said, I'll see you in the morning. He'd go to bed. <laughs> so in the morning, I would let, he'd say, probably one week, can't leave the house. After school, you come home and stay in the house. One particular time, I was two hours late. The car actually had broken down. And this fellow, I must have been 15 then, and I said, I am going to get you know what. So we came to the door. He said, do you want me to come in and explain to your father? I said, no, no, no. <laughs> Don't go near my dad. So he was at the top of the stairs. Again, mother's in bed, sitting like this. He said, you really did it this time. He went like that and went to bed. I think I was in the house for one month on that one. Now, I always told my sisters, you didn't get it nearly as bad as I did. I was a starter, and they, but that's how Dad disciplined. And uh, once he made up his mind, I'd go to Mother and say, couldn't you change Dad's mind a little bit? Never. It was that. Um, good friends, yes, I had some. There were f more or less five of us that kind of piled around together, went bike rides. and. Um, our house was on the way to, well, I won't go back, but that's high school, but we played jacks. <laughs> I was king of the block on the jacks. And uh, we played games inside, but one game which we really loved, we lived on this street called Johnson Street, and there were houses all over. But at night after dinner, we'd go out and we'd get all the neighborhood guys and gals and we'd play kick the can. Did you ever play kick the can? And you could go hide, you know, anywhere. And you never had to worry about a car. Our parents never had to worry about us. They knew we were close by until it was dark. And Pop Pop would go like this, or Dad. And in the house we go. But they were fun, simple games. We had no TV. We had no radio then. Not in those years. And heaven knows I didn't do, I wasn't fond of schoolwork particularly. But we never got schoolwork like you have and even your nieces and nephews have. So um, it was fun. Dad and Mom moved to West Sable and started a family. Uh, we ended up with uh, family was the oldest was Bill. James the second oldest, I was the third oldest, and Jim, and Charles, and Mary Ann. And the, uh, 
fishing business. It was not too lucrative at the time, and uh, or nor chauffeuring. So my dad decided uh, that with the prohibition, he would get back on on the high seas and bring in so-called bootleg booze, and he set up a, a, a series of, of ships to Cuba and purchased two ships which would run from Cuba to Montauk Point. And he solicited his uh, brother-in-law, Gus Konslick. Gus would be on, on the point and when my dad's vessel would uh, come within two miles of shore at high tide, they would dislodge the cases and let them float into the, on shore and they picked them up. And uh, my mom was at the time living in West Sable and she would visit my dad on weekends when, the sh when his ship would dock after uh, a week's uh, voyage from Cuba with no idea of exactly what was taking place. Um, she had a uh, quite a length long car. It was an old Rio, which is uh, of course out of production now. And uh, it was uh, a car that, unbeknownst to her, she was uh, picking up uh, cases of booze and bringing it back to our home in was Sable, unbeknownst to her. And, uh, her complaint to her husband was the uh, car, for some reason, seems to steer uh, much, much heavier than normal, and there must be something with, uh, with the problem of the steering mechanism. And he assured her that everything was fine. Needless to say, that's the way they brought it in, unbeknownst to mom. Um, we had, behind our house, we had an unattached three-car garage and for many months uh, the kids would want to know why the one bay was always non-accessible to, to, to the children or to ourselves. Uh, it had a door and a, and a partition and uh, years and years later we found out that this is exactly where booze would be stored in the top attic of the garage and uh, again my saintly mom would have no idea how, what was taking place. Uh, uh, during the, uh, the course of the transactions uh, the chief of police of West Sable would pay mother a visit and want to know how things were going. Uh, because your husband is on the sea, etc., and she, she always said it was very fine. And uh, his job was to repack and truck in the booze to uh, in New York City. And it was a staging area, basically, from one place to another. According to our, my birth certificate, I was born in West Sable, and um, we, uh, remembering my childhood, I probably would have to start with uh, somewhere between uh, year five to seven, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, we have, we were um, three and a half miles from uh, our grammar school, which was St. Lawrence's, taught by nuns, and uh, the church which we attended was uh, uh, St. Lawrence as well, and it was, of course, uh, a little beyond the buildings. And uh, my mother enrolled me in the root uh, quickly as an altar boy. And I think at, at uh, the year at eight years old. And I can remember getting up very early in the morning and walking with my mom and my brother Jim and walking to church uh, and we served mass in the convent and 
that was at, uh, I think, 6.30 in the morning, and the priest would come over and say Mass for the nuns before school. And uh, I can remember one day walking uh, to school and uh, walking to church, and with a new casket that we had, she would clean those for the priests, you know, plus the altar boy cassocks. And uh, we were late getting out of bed, and my mom insisted we hurry up, and I, I really had to go to the bathroom. And uh, it was very cold, and halfway through, I asked my mom if I could. Uh, and she said, no, you're going to, you got up late and we're going to get on the altar and you're going to serve and so forth. During the communion, I was in a red cassock and just, I couldn't do anything else but let it go. And the priest looked at me and he looked and he could see this black stain coming down my left leg and, and uh, needless to say I was banned from serving for probably a number of weeks but uh, one of the things that I recall. Well dad um, worked with a newspaper in Oswego, New York and then he transferred or got a new job in Washington, New Jersey See, I don't remember all this because I'm still very young. And uh, so during the Depression, he was still in advertising. He would go and buy, get advertising, sell it. Had a good job. And um, so it was during the Depression. And I have to say, I never felt that I didn't know what the Depression was. That would be 1929 to 35, and I was 24. I'm five, six, seven, eight years old. We always had plenty of food, and mother and dad had never had money problems. Um, he wasn't wealthy, nothing like that, but he had a good job. And one day, we were eating lunch, or maybe dinner, but we, well, we were in the kitchen anyway, the table. Knock came on the side door. We had a little porch, and all my friends came to the side door, as my sisters and brothers did. There was a knock at the door at dinner time, and I thought mother and dad looked at me. I said, none of my friends are there, because they knew better than coming during meal times. And um, it was a man. We used the word hobo in those days. He could have been a college professor during the Depression, or he could have been a garbage man. I mean, anything. So we said, could you give me something to eat? I'm hungry. So dad went to the door, and he said, of course we will. So the fellow sat on the steps, and mother gave him a great big plate of food. And he finished it, knocked on the door, and said, I'm all finished. Is there anything I can do? So dad said, yes, uh, you can do, I don't know, something in the backyard, picking up wood or sticks or something. That would be fine. And the fellow said, all right, I, I'll let you know when I'm finished. He came back maybe a half hour later, and he said, I'm finished. And then he went his, on his way. I said, Dad, why did you make him do that? I mean, you know, the poor guy is lonely, he's poor, broke, and so forth. He said, just for one reason, for his dignity. We uh, burned wood in our 
guest in our stove and also in the furnace. And we couldn't afford coal. And we would take the Rio that my mom used to drive, and she would drive it to uh, my grandfather's uh, farm where they had cut wood, and we would pile the wood into the uh, car and bring it home that night. And my brother Charlie, who was in diapers, and we he would sit in the split seats in the front because we had the wood in the back, and we also we sat in the back on top of the wood pile. And what my brother and I would do is we'd get underneath the back of the two seats and take his diapers and begin to twist. And he would say something like, "Cut it out! Please cut it out!" And mom would give him a whack in the face, thinking he was doing something. We were twisting his diaper. <laughs> and uh, uh, just something that we thought was funny, but the uh, poor kid got in trouble. And to this day, I think about that. It was, exactly can you see that kid? She, she didn't have panties then. He had diapers with big pins. <laughs> and the poor kid would probably wet his pants. And then, you know, you twist it a little bit, remember? And mother would belt him, drive it along. <laughs> she was bad. Poor, poor kid. <laughs> what I wanted to be when I grew up has always been to fly an airplane, to be a pilot. Uh, being a, a just wanted to do that. I built planes even when I was with paper. Flew, flew kites and uh, that was my greatest dream to become a fighter pilot. To get along, I, I think I got along with my parent, it, being mom, my mother, my dad was never home. Uh, it was, it was very difficult because she was a taskmaster. Uh, she believed in discipline, and her, uh, I think her, her philosophy was, be good, be faithful. Don't lie, and uh, we could. Then you, we. I didn't know anything about talking, responding to her as, as to uh, my feelings. Uh, I just felt that she was there to guide me, and and, and I had. I, I think I got along very well with her, but again, it was something. In mentally, I, I didn't ask her for anything else but, uh, let's say, be a good person. Mom would would see us off to school with the usual, be good, uh, 
etc. Uh, you could, she did not, she was not a person where you could confide in her and talk to her about if you did have a problem in school or something like that. She had so much to do with the children, the rest of the children, and to raise, to raise them. Uh, she was, uh, she was always there for us, but uh, she was very difficult. Uh, the warm feeling, I knew she loved me, but she never said that. It was, it was never. Never, never, uh, never mentioned. <clears throat> Not having a father around, uh, that it didn't impact impact me uh, to begin with, because we'd always had a brother or a sister or somebody else would we would share and talk and uh, sympathize if you got be you got a whipping or you know if, if you got some problems. But in the course of, of uh, my uh, growing up and in high school, it, it taught me that I have to be responsible for my own actions and I have to make my own decisions, right or wrong. And fortunately, uh, with the upbringing as my mom did, now my father, um, it was an honest uh, area. Uh, didn't lie or cheat, you told the truth. But if I could just jump a hurdle here, one of the, I think one of the drawbacks that I found in my married life, beginning my married life, that a person who's had a father and mother, they could go to them for advice uh, I was always like the child, the kid looking in, looking from the outside in with his nose pressed against the glass. I made my own decisions. So consequently, my, my partner, my wife, would go to her father and make a decision. And, and I could never understand why that wasn't shared. And then I realized that there's a reason for that, and you can't just make your your decision. It's it's got to be made by two people, and that was a that was a, a key problem for a while. And I finally realized that it could be solved. Right? <laughs> yes, I, I I had one person that uh, I relied on, and uh, uh, for for a need, I had a need to talk to someone. It was my Uncle Gus. He was my uh, mother's brother. And he suspected that that's something I did need. And he would uh, describe the environment of uh, the Czech background with all his sisters, that uh, it was uh, cut and dry, everything was sort of cut and dry, and, and your mom loves you, but you have to understand that, and as you get older, you will begin to appreciate the fact that she's bringing you up to be God-fearing and, and your church, uh, that type of thing. Uh, as far as emotions are concerned, he, he said that if you need something and, and you have a problem, even you know going through high school and sophomore and junior year, give me a call or I'll, he usually comes over about every two weeks to see how we were doing. Uh, I confided in him more so than anybody. He was actually my second father. He, he, had, he had stability and he had warm kindness and he had depth perception. He would, he would understand. Uh, a good example of that is the, we caddied when we were, um, grammar school and we did that because it was necessary that was a part of uh, the money that was brought in to maintain a living and uh, at one point he said to me uh, what do you do with your money all of your money and he looked at me uh, his piercing brown eyes I said I give it to my mom and he said one of these days 
you must go to your mother and say, Mom, part of that's mine. I would like to buy sneakers or a jacket or save it for something. And uh, I think then I realized that I had to maintain my individual individuality because no one else would. And that was a very bold statement on his part, and I, I followed through. I caught hell for it, but uh, I, uh, it, was a, it was a turning point for me. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. My dream, um, dreams for myself, we didn't have aspirations as they do today, planning, I'm going to do this. Um, we went more day by day because of the timing and the time. But I do remember one thing. All my friends who took the college prep course, um, go to college, get married, and you have children. That was it. At that time, that was it. I wanted six children. And uh, <laughs> that really was it. I didn't have any business aspirations or... There was nothing for women other than secretarial, nursing, or teacher. Pretty much in that category, and I didn't like any of them. And, uh, of course, I had to choose. So we, our dreams are much more limited than they are today. Well, after high school, I went to college, Centenary Junior College. It was a school in Hackettstown. I was a day student. Backing up just a little, my dad had lost his newspaper. He fo it folded. It was during the war, and the advertising just almost slowed down. So he lost his paper, and we all had, they had plans where we, where we were all going to college, and uh, each one of us, and they couldn't happen because dad had lost his paper and he didn't have a job. That was about four years of a difficult time for him. And mother, oh heavens, it must have been awful for her. So I was able to go to the local junior college in town and they gave anybody who wanted to go a $250 <laughs> donation. So I went there. It was a junior college for young ladies. It really was. It was quite a white gloves, jacket routine. and. Uh, but I enjoyed it. I joined the Glee Club. I took a psychology, which I loved, and English, and uh, some secretarial work. So I went one year, and then Dad was still unemployed or having trouble. I couldn't go back the second year. It was only a two-year school. So I went to work in a local uh, business for two years, I think, 17, 19, about two years. Bored out of my skull. All the boys had started, the war had broken out in 1941. And uh, I thought, and my dad knew I was bored. There was no dates, no nothing. And some way other, the girls that were friends, not best friend, friends, they'd all gone to college out of town. So one day I was sitting up in this office at lunchtime and somebody had brought in some books on women in the service. And they had one for Army, Navy, Marine Corps. So, just for anything to look at and talk about, I started reading them. And I looked at each one and I thought, hmm, that Marine Corps looks kind of nice. I like the uniform. I like the men in the uniform. <laughs> and uh, I thought, I'd like to go in the service. Yeah, I would like that for the t duration of the war. Besides, I was bored, and I wanted to do something else. It wasn't patriotism at that point. It was later on. So I went home to my father, who was 
very Mr. Strict conservative man. I said, Dad, look at this book. I said, I'd like to join the Marine Corps, but I have to have your permission. So Dad said, well, let's read the book and let's talk about it. So he did and we did. Now he said, are you sure you want this? I See, I hadn't been away from home yet because I had to go to college in town. I was a day hop, which I hated, but that's the way it was. So I said, yeah, I really would like it. So that was my first experience of total freedom away from mom and dad and their rules and regulations. So dad said, if you're sure, we trust you, go. So I signed up and away I went to the Marine Corps. That's where you're, that's why you're here, by the way, <laughs> and why you're here. So uh, it was a lovely, lovely time. We were training, uh, we were flight uh, training uh, the crews, uh, and uh, I had a 72-hour uh, pass uh, to go home, and uh, that was the indication that uh, we might have been going overseas sooner than we had thought. And when I got back, and uh, this was uh, uh, October 27th, and on the 28th we went to Mainside with, with one, of, one of my buddies uh, to the sports center, and uh, just they had a, they were having a dance there. We wanted to just see what was going on, and uh, we were way up on the top level of the uh, bleachers, and I happened to look down. There was an arch way in the east corner of the, of the building and in walked three WRs. At that time they called them, they were Marines, Women's Reserve Marines. And the tallest one was, I believe, in the middle. I turned around to my friend and I said, look at that. And he was from Massachusetts, Clarence David Okerfeld. And he said, mm, boy, maybe you should see what she does. I said, I'm going to watch her. If she dances, I'm going to try and get a dance with her. If she doesn't, then I'll go down maybe toward the end of the, of the uh, dance and find out who she is and where she's from. And, and he said, go. I went down and asked her to dance and she she was looking for somebody I, I just didn't understand but she uh, uh, didn't pay any attention to me whatsoever always looking around etc I finally danced with her and for the first time in my life I was a conversationalist and she came back this where you who you are and I told her who I was and she just told me her name was Betty and no last name but I was happy with that and we danced for four or five dances and then the, the uh, dance was over and uh, I asked her if I could walk her back to her barracks and she said no <laughs> I had been to a Spanish class that night, three or four, three or four, I don't remember how many of us went. I thought something different, I'll learn Spanish. So um, 
although I was supposed to have learned at the centenary and I didn't bother. So there was one particular fellow that I liked. Tall, he must have been 6'4", red hair from Brooklyn or somewhere out there. He was so handsome. So dad was saying I was looking for somebody. I kept waiting for him to walk in there and he never did. But anyway, we went in and uh, I looked around at the people and I saw these two fellows up there and uh, paid no attention to them. But I didn't see the redhead and I was very disappointed, of course. But he was so true to the girl back home, darn his hide. <laughs> so when Dad asked me to dance, um, he was a nice dancer, he really was. And uh, we talked, he was handsome. Uh, we we jived, we really did. But I mean, sparks? No, no, there were no sparks. Uh, I mean, you know, a friend or an acquaintance, actually. So when he asked to walk me home, I said no, because I was going with the girls. We left the rec hall of Paris Island, but not with my dancing partner, but with my girlfriends that I came to <laughs> came up there with. And um, he had called several times. I really wasn't overly interested. He was nice looking and fun, but I had a lot of friends in the squad room. So eventually he um, asked me to play golf one day. And <laughs> I didn't know how to play golf course. So he yeah, he took it. Um, I borrowed a sweater because we had to be in uniform at all times except for sports. So I borrowed a sweater and uh, the clothes and he was had his arms around me trying to show me how to do it because I didn't catch on at all. Absolutely naive but uh, it was just I think it was starting very, very slowly, and uh, we enjoyed each other's company more and more and more. I will have to comment on one thing, which is a terrible thing to be telling our children and grandchildren. Um, there was very little entertainment on Paris Island, and of course, Dad was a PFC or a corporal, and he sent half his money home to his mother on allotment, so he had no money. I spend all mine somewhere. So there was nothing really to do with slop shoot. I didn't drink. And you really didn't drink either, so we didn't go in there. Well, I worked in a place called Recruit Depot. Great, huge room. And uh, behind it was this huge room called the Blue Room. And uh, where people would go, there was nowhere to sit on the island, if you wanted to just walk, you wanted to sit somewhere and talk, there really wasn't a place to do it. So I said, well, let's go back and recruit depot. I've seen other people who use it. So Dad said, sure, let's go. So we did, and um, it was dark. I thought, gee, there's nobody in this place. So we went back in the blue room, and we necked a little. <laughs> We did, it was fun. <clears throat> but the, <clears throat> the funny part of it is, when the lights finally went on, after an hour of necking, but it was strict, I mean, that's all it was, kids. There were people all over the place doing the same thing, maybe doing more, I had never. They run all the couches, all the chairs, remember that, John? And that was a place to meet, so we did. I told her how I felt. I said I was uh, very, uh, uh, I liked you very much. And I was falling in love with you, and and, uh, and she couldn't understand uh, so soon, so quickly, and so forth. And I told her how happy I was with meeting you, and uh, it began began to, uh, uh, I I would say, looked promising. And I told her uh, after two months how I really felt, and she could not. She said, "Well, I like you, and and uh, I, I think it's you know, I don't know too much about you, and so forth." So 
the rumor spread that the wing was moving, our squadron was going overseas, and uh, I, I just I almost gave up. I just couldn't. We were supposed to go in the next two weeks beyond that. It was three weeks, I guess it was. So I said, uh, she said, I, I understand you're leaving to go overseas. And I said, no, we're, we're not going over yet, but it'll be within two to three weeks. And she said something to me, and then I knew the breakthrough. She said, yes, I, I, I may feel the way you feel, and I, 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 I'm very, very strongly liking you and so forth. And, you never said the word love, but I kept saying it, of course. So uh, when I got to uh, Hawaii, we went over on a carrier, and uh, I was talking to a fellow I never knew. He was, uh, I think he was one of our pilots uh, that flew in there, and he and I got together after a couple of weeks, and he said, uh, I, I mentioned something about my girlfriend and so forth. And uh, he said, you know, Marine, you know what you want to do? You want to send her, send her an engagement ring. I don't care how big it is, how small it is, because you're, then she's branded. And if you want to hang on to that, do that, because a Marine, another Marine would respect that. So I went down to the PX and, and I got this, I couldn't even see the diamond. But, and uh, I sent it to you, right? When he left, I realized that I liked him a lot. That was it. I liked him a lot. And whether it was going anywhere, remember, this was the age of war, but it was also the age of innocence for an awful lot of us. And I was included in that, and actually so was Dad, Papa. So when he went overseas, and then he sent me the ring for the PX through the mail, somebody called and said, Sergeant, you have some mail. So off I went to the little post office, and there was my little box with my little ring, which I still have, by the way. It broke, and uh, we became engaged. <laughs>